So basically, I was talking about the problem of breeding of dogs with, you know, stub noses. They have a specific problem as far as breathing is concerned, which becomes more complicated as they age. And that is extremely cruel uh, because if you see how these dogs breathe, their breathing pattern and the kind of breathing difficulties that they undergo, a breeding of such dogs must be stopped immediately. And that can be done only if people make a choice of not buying such dogs, not otherwise. Uh, because any sort of legislation bringing in a complete prohibition on things like these, where there is, you know, an illegal demand, <clears throat> cannot be curbed unless people are sensitized, made aware, and there is a change in the, it's sad to say, but consumer mindset. Because it is people who are creating this demand. So until and unless, uh, you know, there is, uh, enough awareness which helps bring a change in the mindset of people uh, these things cannot be stopped completely only with the power of law it has to be coupled with change in people's mindsets and ideologies another problem is breeding of uh, dogs um, a selective breeding of dogs in a manner which makes them aggressive for dog fighting or for getting these dogs to go and hunt wildlife. Uh, you might have seen a lot of videos <laughs> which are, you know, in public domain, which are very brazenly being shared by these very people who are raising and breeding these. First of all, they make the dogs aggressive. Then they specifically breed male and female, both aggressive dogs, in order to have aggressive litter of puppies. So it becomes easier for them to use them for the purpose that they would like. Fauna Police, an NGO, has been putting out a lot of videos on their Instagram page, sharing, uh, it's an animal rights organization <coughs> based in Delhi, sorry. They have been putting out these videos, which they have been getting through their sources, which show how dogs like pit bulls and other, uh, you know, bully kutta, etc. are being used for hunting wildlife or for killing stray dogs, for fun, for making videos. And uh, this, this needs to stop, meaning because unless uh, this stops, this kind of cruelty, this kind of abuse, the vicious cycle is going to continue. So while... Uh, there needs to be more that needs to be done by the government in terms of bringing a policy which prohibits the breeding of these kind of dogs, which is extremely cruel. While having a St. Bernard and a Siberian Husky or a German Shepherd in a country like India is definitely not right. But it is cruel to another level to have or to allow breeding of dogs with, you know, a flattened nose because of, like I explained, the breathing, the, uh, the breathing problem that they undergo. So also breeding of aggressive dogs in order to have aggressive litter of puppies, then using them for dog fighting. See, we have to understand that it is not only about animal cruelty with these aggressive dogs. They may also pose a threat to humans. And that will, you know, uh, have an impact on the mindset of people about dogs in general, then people will not see that it was a specific breed of dog that was bred by a specific person for exactly this purpose. What people will see is dog has bitten somebody or dog has attacked somebody, right? So th these things are very important. While there is a lot that needs to be done on the policy end, by the government in terms of amending the dog breeding and marketing rules to prohibit breeding of these certain specific breeds of dogs. There is also more that needs to be done in terms of awareness, in terms of people making ethical choices. Because that is not ethics and morals are not something which you can imbibe into people. You can inform them, you can make them aware 
and then it is for them to make a choice so we are hoping that better sense will prevail and with you know the advancement in technology with the advancement in people's lives they will also advance in terms of compassion in terms of making an ethical choice which does not contribute to the suffering of animals so <clears throat> i think the point that you made about breeding aggressive dogs is is very notable because people don't actually realize it's not the breed that we have to blame it's Correct. actually the aggress uh, the aggression is induced and we also saw this recent case where um, a pit bull actually mauled an 8 year old woman to death and we also found that media houses actually um, reported this incident so irresponsibly because they said this is why you shouldn't buy a pit bull this is why you shouldn't buy an aggressive dog but what they don't realize is we need to stop breeding not okay. just to make them aggressive or to make mm -hmm. them good or kind or whatever we need to stop breeding in general true so so moving on to the next question Mm -hmm. so i uh, recently read an article about zoos and it kind of sparked my interest uh, what i wanted to know is whether entertainment and human amusement are a sufficient justification and grounds for keeping animals in captivity or and are they like just uh, prisons for wild animals absolutely not answering your first first half of your question and the second half certainly they are prison for animals for animals which have committed no crime just because of you know their existing these infrastructure of zoos which are unfortunately considered as a part of ex situ conservation if you look up what is ex situ conservation zoos are a part of ex situ conservation and um, this this is something that needs to go away thankfully some ifs officers uh despite of being part of the system are vocal about bringing this change uh in the system or rather at least voicing against it saying that this is something which must end we cannot have more zoos existing ones eventually need to be phased out and shut down existing zoos cannot be allowed to upgrade and have more animals no new zoos no upgrading of existing zoos whatever zoos exist let them run the way they are once all the animals are you know have passed away convert those zoos into a rescue center or something like that which is more useful to wildlife than captivating wild animals into spaces which are a few thousand uh, square feet and uh you know a, a tiger or a lion in the wild would ac approximately travel 50 kilometers a day and what space you give them even if it is 20 50 60 000 square feet it is not sufficient because it is nowhere close to what they get in the wild and it is completely you know and that is exactly from where the word has been coined zoonotic behavior zoonotic behavior has been observed in wild animals not only lion tiger but also in animals like monkeys birds like parakeets or other birds where they inflict harm on themselves self destruction is the term so they start uh, destroying their own hand or leg or a particular body part because they are frustrated they and that frustration you can imagine has crossed that level of patience where the animal is trying to kill itself by trying to you know in uh, trying to injure its own body people think animal is eating its own flesh no they are trying to cause harm in order to cause their own death that is the extent to which they are mentally you know disturbed and that is something which is known as a you know zoonotic behavior so this is something uh, which is very commonly observed in zoos uh, especially elephants swaying their head up and down or sideways left and right some people think oh the answer is uh, the elephant is answering to certain questions 
which is absolutely sad because that is not the case. This is a typical behavioral pattern which shows that the animal is mentally disturbed and depressed and is in lack urgent is in urgent need of care and rehabilitation so we have come across situations where you know we have seen the kind of uh, treatment that these animals are subjected to if you dig up certain reports for example the delhi zoo has a reputation for animals dying uh, very often over there high deaths high mortality rate uh, so this is this is sad but you know what is happening is once these animals die more are procured from other zoos <laughs> and uh, the 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 unfortunate part being these animals cannot be released in the wild all of a sudden because they have been captivated for so many years altogether that their instinct of surviving in the wild has drastically gone down because of being constantly captivated not being allowed to hunt not being allowed to search for their own food so zoos definitely are something which need to be phased out in in a in a proper uh, manner not that i'm saying all zoos need to shut down today because that would be impractical to suggest so it needs to be done in a phased manner but we need to do away with zoos we need to stop adding more animals to existing zoos stop adding to newer zoos in the country and eventually these zoos need to be made into rescue transit centers where injured uh, wildlife can be treated can be uh, you know hospitalized for care and then be released back in the wild which is what is lacking if you see the infrastructure of rescue transit centers in the country it is a deplorable sight so many so many cities or rather majority of cities lack a rescue transit facility but they will have zoos which is which is such an irony that you have a zoo but you do not have a rescue transit center to provide basic medical care to wildlife so yes Yeah, so, so one of the primary arguments in defense of uh, keeping zoos is in the name of species conservation. So, uh, the question that I would like to follow to what your answer right now is: Does the need uh, for species conservation outweigh the cost to individual animal welfare? Certainly not, and this is, I would say, uh, you know, a way of trying to hide the. the cruelty in the in in zoos by saying that oh it is a necessary evil for species conservation it is certainly not because species conservation can be done much better if governments and forest department were to focus on preserving the habitat of those animals in the wild than to remove those animals from the wild and subject them to breeding programs in captivity and then these very animals majority of them which are bred in captivity uh, where there are certain programs for captive breeding which the government runs or the forest department of that particular state runs majority of these animals are not released in the wild because they are bred in captivity they are kept in captivity and imagine the first generation what what would be the plight of those animals what would be the condition the mental condition of those animals you are catching those animals from the wild they are they are used to living in forest undisturbed by humans you suddenly catch them and you put them in an enclosure for captive breeding program is it fair and imagine the fate of generations of these animals that are put into captive breeding program what is the future they are relegated to captivity most of them so i don't think it is worth it because and this is this is just an excuse i would say if the government and the forest department is really serious about species conservation they can very well do they have enough infrastructure and machinery in place to protect wildlife in their own habitat if it comes to that they will very well do it like we have done it i'm not saying the government has not done it tigers 
once a depleting population today though is not what it used to be earlier is slowly and steadily becoming better right the numbers have gone up so if the government wants to do it they can very well do it if they have the will to do it and the government themselves have shown that they can do it so it is just about replicating it again perhaps in a little innovative way but it can be done and this government this very indian government has shown and when i say indian government means it also includes state and the forest department etc but i mean the system as a whole has shown us they have themselves done it these tigers are not bred in captivity these tigers are very much in the wild what the governments have done is safeguarded their homes which is exactly what you need to do for species that are threatened so yeah yes yeah, so um moving on to the next question mm -hmm. uh, many people in india own exotic species of animals and this ownership is mostly illegal mm -hmm. animals such as pythons lizards and alligators and many other such live exotic uh, species are smuggled into india every year and in deplorable conditions and countless indians blindly choose to purchase and keep these animals as pets so we also observe that there is a lack of knowledge awareness and sensitivity among people about the different species made available in uh, various pet markets so so can you tell us about the instances where you have dealt with such illegal ownership of exotic animals as well as their sale in live markets many occasions rather uh, if you see pet shops in your own area you will find pet shops selling uh, bajrigars cockatiels macaws etc which are not native to our country which are all exotic imported from some country or the other uh, may not be imported now but perhaps imported at some point of time maybe 5 7 years ago and then being bred here and their generations being sold but the point being that the you know whenever wherever it started it was these animals which were imported from whichever country that they belong to for example an african grey parrot uh is a bird that is found in the wild in africa but look at the sad reality in our country that they are found in cages in people's homes now how is this happening african grey parrots in africa have not only become end endangered but they are extinct in africa so while they are extinct in their own country of origin they are very much found here in india and in other countries where exotic pet trade is legal and how they are being kept in the in captivity if i were to give you an example if you were to come across an african grey in africa he or she would not behave in the same manner that an african grey in somebody's house would behave why because these birds have been stolen from the wild whenever it started like i said maybe not this batch but the earlier batch 5 years ago 7 years ago whenever they were imported featherless birds babies removed from the nest and put into captivity hand raised by humans to tame them to make them used to humans to make them feel that humans are their parents humans are their family and hence an african grey would behave in a different manner probably come and sit on your shoulder and eat food from your hand or perhaps talk or i don't know do what uh, what other horrible things that we as humans can make them do uh, tame them into doing rather and if you see an african grey in the wild and you try to approach it it will bite you so this talks about what we do to animals in order to subserve our purpose of entertainment or wanting to make them as companions so laws regarding exotic species are still not uh, you know very clear so to say but thankfully the government has started something called the parivesh portal 
the Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change has started a Parivesh portal where it is mandatory for everyone to register exotic species in their possession. Failing to do so is an offence and suitable action can be taken by the chief wildlife warden of that particular state, including seizure of those animals. So the government has started an initiative to basically streamline uh, this. But what I would say is that this trade itself needs to be prohibited. It needs to stop now. Damage is already done. But what needs to be done now is further damage needs to be prevented by, you know, imposing very stringent conditions on the trade of these species. We have CITES and we have other, you know, legislations which are not really legislations, but they are treaties, which India is a party to. But there is a lack of a specific law that deals with the trade of exotic species. From what I understand from the, you know, material available uh, online, the government in a Wildlife Protection uh, Amendment Act is planning to bring in a regulation for exotic species. We are hoping that it will be a strong piece of <coughs> legislation, which is watertight and not something with loopholes, which will allow the trade to go on. Because we have seen the downside of this trade. A lot of species are invasive species. For example, the red-eared slider, a turtle species, which is very commonly kept as pets by a lot of people. And when they start growing bigger, they are people realize that, okay, we cannot keep them in homes. So they go and release them in ponds or lakes or other water bodies, which is the most horrible and the, you know, uh, the worst thing to do. Why I say so is because red-eared slider are invasive species. They will invade the local native species of our country, perhaps even kill them and increase their own population in our country. And hence, trade of red-eared sliders is expressly prohibited in the European Union. They are not allowed to be kept as pets or their trade is also completely prohibited. For this very reason, the purpose of the Wildlife Protection Act is to conserve and to protect our native species. So it needs to do more to conserve and protect our native species from such invasive species that are being brought into our country in an unregulated manner. Uh, if you see the DRI, the Directorate of Revenue Intelligence, as also, which is a uh, which is a body under the, or which is rather an institution under the Ministry of Finance, has started cracking down on breeders and individuals who are into the who are into the trade of exotic species because of money laundering or because of you know uh, illegal transactions of money as far as that is concerned. So, and uh, very recently, twenty uh, you know exotic crocodile babies and. Uh, albino monkey was seized by the Directorate of Revenue Intelligence of Mumbai from a particular person who was who had brought these animals from some foreign country into a suitcase. So the trade is massive. What is intercepted is barely in single digit percentage. Uh, so there is there is a need for better detection, better intervention, and also for, again, it all boils down to the demand from people. If there is no demand, there will be no supply. But till there is a demand, there will be all sorts of methods which these smugglers will use, roadways, airways, waterways, and all other, you know, methods of smuggling wildlife into the country and trading in them. So it is extremely cruel. It is not something one can be proud of. If somebody has an African grey parrot that they have purchased or any other exotic species that they are in possession of, it is not something one can be proud of. 
because these species have been stolen from the wild if not them their uh, you know immediate um, you know the the previous generations were stolen from the wild and they are also wild after all they are wild exotic species just because you term them exotic non native does not make them less wild only because you have tamed them you have taken away majority of their wild instincts does not uh, deprive them or take away the fact that they are wild animals they are wild birds but yes which belong to some other country we say non native because not native to india but native to some country for example there are brazilian pocket monkeys which are native to brazil they are found in the wild in brazil but just because we find them in homes here does not make them domestic animals they are still wild which we have unfortunately you know made that tamed them or whatever and made them uh, you know domestic or exotic or whatever and you will find lot of images on the internet which will show you how in you know bottles uh, plastic bottles birds are you know the birds are inserted and they are brought majority of them die of suffocation but the profit the margin is so much that they are willing to uh, forego that loss <coughs> that they are suffering because one exotic bird or one exotic animal is sold for thousands of rupees certain species even lakhs of rupees so the margin or the profit that they make behind one sale is so much that they can easily forego the loss of all those animals that you know have died during transportation so uh, speaking morally and ethically it is not only on those who are into this trade but the death of these animals is also on those who choose to purchase these animals while fully well knowing that these are the downsides of the trade if you claim to love an african grey you must admire and you must have that love in your heart but let that animal be in wild by purchasing and bringing home an african grey you have contributed to perhaps the death of 100 other african greys who have died during transportation because of your demand to have an african grey in your house and similarly other species so there are so many instances where uh, these exotic species are sold in live markets like crawford market russell market and so many other markets and these just go highly unregulated and also um, like you said these animals undergo so much cruelty even when it comes to transporting them or rather in the way that they looked after uh, i remember an instance that you were mentioning um, where uh, an, an elderly lady had a monkey as a pet animal but she did not know how to care for it ended up feeding it human food and by the time the animal was rescued it was so obese and had so many health problems that ultimately it's it's a permanent damage had been done to its life true true parakeets kept in this small a cage seven of them out of that six of them have had started self infliction of you know self destruction inflicting pain or injury on their own body because they were fed up of captivity they thought it is better to die and imagine the slow and painful death every single day to injure your own body until you die to go through that suffering one cannot even you know fathom the kind of pain that these animals go through but unfortunately so many of us have turned a blind eye to the suffering of these animals so we find that um, laws for the protection of the rights of animals in india still has a long way to go uh, in terms of creating a safe and a cruelty free environment for animals every day we hear instances of cruelty where people are able to commit the most uh, inhuman crimes against animals and they get away with it with just a slap on the wrist so you've even been vocal in various interviews on the much needed legislative reforms that have to be brought in um so that we can better protect the rights of these animals so can you please educate us about your views on this 
Sorry, couldn't catch the last bit. Educate on. So can you just educate our viewers on these uh, reforms that we need in terms of punishment? Uh -huh. Okay. So basically, we were hoping that, you know, uh, the amendment to the PC Act, which the government had proposed to bring in, would be tabled in this monsoon session of parliament. But that has unfortunately not happened. The Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Amendment Bill has not found place on the list of bills that are scheduled to be tabled in this monsoon session of parliament. But we are hoping that in the coming winter session of parliament, it will be uh, you know, one of the bills which will be introduced by the government, thereby amending the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act 1960, which I mentioned is an age-old legislation bearing penalties and penal provisions from the year 1960, which has since not seen an amendment. But the positive step in this direction is that the government has understood and taken cognizance of the need of the amendment in this law and has proposed an amendment. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have already sent in your suggestions to the government saying that, you know, stronger laws are required, certain heinous offenses towards animals like brutal torture and, he you know, intentional killing need to be made non-available in nature in order to set a deterrent. So we are hopeful that such a strong bill will be, uh, you know, uh, seen in the parliament in the days to come. And we are sure that beyond party lines, beyond politics, all uh, lawmakers will vote for such a change for animals. Because it is not just for animals, but it is for the safety of society at large. Stronger animal protection laws mean better safety and security of citizens at large. Why do I say so? Is because animal abusers often don't stop at abusing animals. Most of them go on to abusing fellow humans, first starting with children, women, elderly, and then others. So if we are able to control crimes against animals, we will be able to control cases of crimes against humans. There are innumerable cases, including that of serial killer Virappan, who was heavily into hunting, poaching, who had killed hundreds of elephants and other wild animals and had also killed so many people. So, and, and there are numerous such instances, not only in our country, but internationally, which is why in the US, the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, investigates serious or heinous cases of cruelty towards animals. Because FBI has taken cognizance of the fact and made it a policy that serious crimes towards animals will have to be investigated by the FBI so that further crimes towards humans can be prevented. So yes, there is a need for a change in our law, also in the manner in which crimes against animals are looked upon as a society at large, including the National Crime Records Bureau, NCRB, maintaining a database of crimes against animals. That is also something which the government must uh, take into account and have a database on, because as on date, the NCRB does not maintain a database on crimes against animals. So we are hopeful that these changes in the coming days, in the coming years, we will see such positive changes happening. And even the society at large, apart from what the government does, will be a part of this change actively, will demand such change because the government will do things which the people demand. If there is a demand for a certain thing by the citizenry of this country, will the government take cognizance of it? So people at large need to realize, animal lovers or not, for the safety of our own families, for our own society, we must demand stronger animal protection laws. Yeah. So uh, as you mentioned about the FBI and how they have been uh, good at enforcing the laws, uh, we'd like to know how the law enforcement agencies in India, are, are they like well equipped to handle such cases of cruelty? And is there like a lack of awareness on part of the police with respect to registering complaints? Thankfully, in the last... 10 years, if I have to compare 
what used to happen or what was the position 10 years ago to what it is now, I would say it is much, much, much better. Because when I started dealing with cruelty cases, there was total apathy on the part of police in terms of sensitivity, in terms of even being aware of an act called the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act even being existing. They had no knowledge about it. But now, uh, thankfully, with increasing awareness, with more and more responsible senior officers, uh, you know, taking cognizance of the fact that animal cruelty is also something that needs to be viewed seriously, with police officers being trained on animal protection laws, being sensitized towards the plight of animals, a lot has changed. But yes, there is still scope for things to get better, for things to still change and become even better than what they are as on date. Yes. So we find that although we have laws which are protecting animals and punishing um, the cruelty against animals, what is important for us to realize is that we have to address the root cause of the problem because as the saying goes, prevention is better than cure. And we find that the major reason that um, there exists cruelty towards animals is the lack of empathy that people feel towards them. So this made us curious as to how is it that people actually view these uh, voiceless beings. You rightly said empathy, compassion, uh, sense or the virtue of ahimsa is very important and must be imbibed in every child. And that is exactly why uh, PETA has a CC, Compassion Citizen Program, for kids aged 8 to 13. And there is even a module which the Animal Welfare Board of India has endorsed, which has been prepared by PETA, which the AWBR has recommended all schools, government and private, to inculcate in their curriculum for school children. Because if children are compassionate, if children are uh, empathetic towards animals, automatically their parents will also become empathetic towards animals. And I think not exposing children to violent things is one thing that parents need to do as responsible parents and responsible citizens of the country to ensure that children don't get desensitized at a very early age. A lot of people in, uh, you know, various videos I have watched online on YouTube, etc., which you can also watch. When animal sacrifice is taking place, which is a very contentious issue, but it is pertinent to mention this, kids are witnessing animals being sacrificed their throats being slit, blood just, you know, flowing out of the animal's body as the animal suffers and, you know, suffocates and dies. Uh, sites like these will only desensitize children. And making children sensitive will also ensure a better society for everybody. Because a desensitized child is more prone to committing violence and crime than a child who is sensitive. So a sensitive child is not a weak child. It is a child who is empathetic, who is compassionate, who is a responsible citizen, who will have a rational sense of being. But a child that is subjected to violence, cruelty, or one which is exposed to violence and cruelty at a young age, at a tender age, and desensitized, will be more prone to committing violence, will be more prone to committing crimes. And hence, it is in the interest of our own society and of those kids or of those children that they are sensitized, they are made aware not only of, like I said, 
And it's not only citizens of this country as adults who need to develop a scientific temper and a spirit of humanism, but it needs to be inculcated in children as well that we are responsible as species who think are supreme, as species who have brought in so much of change on this planet Earth, it is also our responsibility to care for these animals, for they cannot care for themselves. So, sir, I think you very aptly put a cross as to how we how we have to change our mindset and attitude and sort of expand our circle of compassion to include animals as well. So, so I'm sure you faced your fair share of struggles when you were pursuing a career in uh, the field of animal rights advocacy. So we wanted to ask you what advice you would give to budding lawyers who want to go down the same path. Be persistent. Don't give up. Because there will be somebody or the other in the system who will do what is the right thing to do. There was an instance, there was a case that I had recently dealt with where the local police was insensitive towards the plight of that particular animal, which was being subjected to cruelty. I tried to raise it with the deputy superintendent of police uh, who was also not very inclined to do anything about it. But when I took up the matter with the superintendent of police, the district police chief, there was immediate action on his part with a direction to register a first report that is an FIR and take necessary legal steps in that direction. So you will certainly find somebody in the system who will be empathetic. You must have that trust, faith, and that positive attitude in yourself that even if there are two steps, there are hurdles at two steps, the third or the fourth step will be something which will be a ray of hope and which will be something which will get the work done. And not giving up is not a choice because if we give up, we are giving up on those animals which are counting on us. So for those animals, we must go on. We must keep at it. Thank you so much for your advice, sir. I am sure that everybody who was listening here today would have taken away some valuable insights. And we also hope that we've ignited a passion in everybody to pursue this cause. And for those of you who had no prior knowledge about animal cruelty, we certainly hope that we were able to shed some light on the same. So I would like to summarize um, the key takeaways from what we have said, sir. So, so animals are like being subject to incessant and unnecessary cruelty as it is evident from the inst instances that you have mentioned in the dairy industry, breeding and puppy mills, testing, factory farming and the entertainment industry. Um, so you have said that the law which is supposed to come to the rescue of these sentient beings are not stringent enough to protect their rights. The punishment for cases of cruelty are so weak that the offenders commit the most inhuman crimes against these animals and are able to get away. So we believe that we cannot justify disregarding the interests or suffering of non-human animals for either for profit or for entertainment. Uh, we believe that equal suffering should count equally. Sir, on behalf of the Animal Rights Wing and the Podcast Committee of Ramaya College of Law, we extend our heartfelt gratitude to you for spending your valuable time with us today and enlightening us on this cause and inspiring us and most importantly, empowering us to fight for the rights of animals. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.